Today on Education Forum, the Faculty Center for Teaching and Learning, an interview with Dr. Susan Rock. From the studio, high atop Jordan Hall in the College of Education and Health Professions at Columbus State University in Columbus, Georgia, this is Education Forum with your hosts, Jeff Conklin and Greg Blaylock. Education Forum. I'm Jeff Conklin here with my co-host Greg Blaylock. Good morning, Greg. Good morning, Jeff. How are you? I'm doing well. How about yourself? I'm doing all right, thanks. Good. Today's guest on Education Forum is the director of the Center of, for Teaching and Learning here at Columbus State University, Dr. Susan Rock. Welcome to Education Forum. Thank you, Jeff. We're glad to have you on. Thanks. I'm happy to be here. Well, great. Um, let's start out by just getting a little bit of, of information about you and your background. And uh, so, how long have you been here at CSU? I arrived at CSU in 1999. Okay. Yeah, straight out of grad school. Okay, and where was grad school? Grad school was University of Washington in okay. Seattle. Okay. Mm -hmm. Quite a change from Seattle to here. Yeah, it was. Well, I had a little intermediate stint um, while I was writing my dissertation in western Oklahoma. Okay. And so Columbus <laughs> it's kind was, of on the way. <laughs> yeah. Columbus, Columbus was the Garden of Eden next uh, to that Oklahoma. spot, so I was thrilled. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And you're originally from? Pittsburgh. Okay, and mm -hmm. did you get your undergrad there? Or? No, I. Um, we actually moved around a bit uh, when I was growing up, and um, I went to high school up in Metro Atlanta. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. At Lassiter in Cobb mm -hmm. County. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. And uh, actually, um, you know, attended the Governor's Honors Program here in Georgia, and but at that time we didn't have the Hope Scholarship. Okay. And. Um, I was really into, I, I, we had not lived in the South long enough for it to really feel like home to mm -hmm, me. Mm -hmm. So I was applying to colleges back up in the North and okay. ended up at Notre Dame. Ah, very mm -hmm. good, yeah. very good. Now, what is your field of interest? Um, I teach um, British Renaissance literature. Okay. Um, but all of us in English studies are um, uh, expected to be able to teach uh, intro writing, so okay. freshman composition. Um, so I do that. And um, another course that I teach often and I really love is the sophomore level survey in world literature. Okay. And I do the early half of that, so it's mm -hmm. ancient up to um, about 1660. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Jeff was telling me, we were talking about British literature yesterday, Jeff was telling me he has a hard time getting through it because he can't get past the accent when he's reading. <laughs> is, that, is that problematic? Yeah, usually, well, in my case, it's the language itself almost yeah. um, beyond the accent. You know, yeah. it's, we have to learn how to read early modern English and that, sure. um, yes. that is not a transparent thing for students. So. No, how well does that work with students? Is that difficult? Well, I think as long as you're really transparent about the fact that it's an issue. Okay. You know, like, don't try do, to hide it. No. I do not expect you to um, know immediately what you're reading and how to make sense of it. And so mm -hmm. let's take our time getting um, kind of immersed in this sentence structure and in some cases the um, wacky spelling and, mm -hmm. you know, have fun with it. Yeah. I, okay. I think Col it's, Color with a U, that sort of stuff. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, not even that. We're, we're um, sometimes faced with texts where U's are shaped like V. Oh, right, sure. that okay, whole right, thing. Yeah. Okay. Unto beginning with a big V, mm -hmm, and right. um, so you know, I project things up on the screen, and we we read through it and talk talk explicitly about you know how to find the verb and you know what's going on here, and so mm -hmm. I think once they feel comfortable, once I guess you acknowledge that this is not something we should be intimidated by, but think of it as kind of part of the um, experience of working with this literature, okay. then we're on board and mm -hmm. everyone's okay about asking questions and, um, and, and then I think they like it more than they think they would. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. okay. Once you, they get into it. Do, yeah. you, do you find yourself, especially kind of in some intro classes around that, do mm -hmm. you find yourself providing towards the beginning of the semester like direct instruction? Or is it more a discovery learning type thing where they have texts that they read and then, and then you analyze the texts and you use mm. that 
to uh, provide instruction related to language. Do you know what I yeah. mean? Yeah. Well, you that? I think a, um, a little both. Mm, okay. um, everyone's always reading, you know, before a class on their own. Sure, mm -hmm. okay. But then um, I, because the older time periods often also involve a lot of poetry, a lot of verse, it's it's very um, close reading and slow going. So we can spend, you know, an easy 75 minutes talking about, you know, two or three sonnets. Um, I bet, sure. So it's, it's sort of an interesting thing. I mean, the, the amount of reading that I can generally assign students is not nearly the volume that they might be asked to read of a modern novel. Okay. I mean, I can't sure. assign 100 pages of Paradise Lost. That's just not <laughs> going to happen. No, no, no. But, um, but I think, you know, what they get from, from close reading of, of short passages is a more... Um, um, fine ability to kind of pay pay close attention to small things and um, learn how language works. You know, once we have a chance to pull it all apart in class. Uh -huh. So, I it's it's sort of funny. I mean, after you um, have done this for long enough, I get totally overwhelmed by the idea of teaching a novel. Is that right? Okay. Yeah, sure. I mean, okay. I think, oh my gosh, there's hundreds of pages. What are we going to do <laughs> with all of this? How are we going to fit this in? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, do you have some um, favorite pieces that um, that you just love doing year after oh, year, yeah. or discussing, or does it change over time? Well, I always put things on the syllabus that I myself don't really know, oh, or okay, I don't know well. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Because I really like kind of that shared discovery, okay. and and I think um, when I first started and I was first assigned this world literature survey, I mean it's so impossible to have come out of grad school having familiarity with all of that you know it's ancient Chinese ancient Indian I mean there's no way that you would know it all sure and then I discovered that it's really fun to go into class and say well hmm so this Bhagavad Gita thing <laughs> what do you think I mean I you know it's the first time for me too and so um, I really enjoy um, that you know, opportunity. I have learned so much over the past 14 years. Okay. And I'm now, I think, sort of reaping the benefit of finally having read enough that there isn't as much new material to me, for me anymore. But I, you know, but I'm, I'm eager to go to things that are less familiar. Sure. Gives um, you that edge a little bit. Again. Yeah. 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 But they like, let me think. Um, we did actually just do some Milton, some Paradise Lost, okay. and they got very fired up about the character of Satan in book one. We had a lot of fun All with right. that. Um, and um, they tend to like Christopher Marlowe, okay. who is a little more risque than they imagined um, uh -huh. the sure. period. I, I like also to sort of shake people out of their um, expectations for older time periods. Okay. They either think everyone was extremely formal and, you know, well behaved, right. which right. of course is never the case. Sure. In literature particularly. Right. Yes. Or or they have expectations about I think maybe things being sort of uh, oversimplified or primitive and they're surprised that in fact there's so many things that we can really connect to and feel like very modern mm -hmm. kinds of dilemmas and so mm -hmm. um, it's fun. Which it I sounds think, fun. Yeah, yes, yeah. it really and does. I, yeah. and, you know, that's, I would imagine one of the primary goals of, of any course you would teach is mm -hmm. to connect this literature to their own lives yes. and make it real to them and applicable, whether it has to do with um, poetry or, or otherwise. Absolutely. And, you know, it's, um, this is something I actually thought a lot about in graduate school, but um, the only way we can really know the past is through mm -hmm. our own present lens, right? So well, there's, sure. mm -hmm. as much as we might like to imagine we can time travel and be immersed in that moment, it's gone. I mean, yes. we'll never really fully know how it felt to live at that moment and be in that culture. Um, so as long as you kind of find that balance between respecting what was specific about the past that is different than now and we can't ever really fully understand, 
but also knowing that the only way we can kind of own it for ourselves is to think about our own experiences and how mm -hmm. we relate mm -hmm. you know that mm -hmm. that that um that connection makes all the difference mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. sure does mm -hmm. now what about yourself what kind of writing have you done well let's see um I have done um, some scholarly work on manuscript texts, which has involved um, some archival work in England. Okay. And I've been so lucky. I didn't know when I came to CSU that we had such a um, growing international studies sure, yeah, program. Yeah, yeah. And in fact, Neil McCrillis came just, I think, a year or two before I did. Okay. So I suppose the whole thing's sort of been growing as I've been sure. here myself. but. Um, but I've had the opportunity to go over and be at the Spencer House mm -hmm. on a number of occasions and do some of my own research while I'm there. So, um, so I've looked at some rare um, letters and commonplace books written by women in the period mm -hmm. um, because they were not ever um, published in a print form, which was also common to the period. There were lots of things that were never brought into print publication. Mm -hmm. um, and I have uh, written about, you know, how to make sense out of this particular genre of letters that we think of as mother's advice. Uh, okay. Mother's legacies, they're sometimes called, because women um, were prohibited by law from um, bequeathing property. They didn't own any, they weren't so there's allowed to own any, there was right, right. no property. So they um, often uh, wrote letters or, um, particular kinds of documents that um, were more like spiritual bequests to their children, oh. how to lead a good life, okay. um, mm -hmm. how to conduct yourself, how to have a sort of a daily routine that was profitable. <laughs> and um, so that, that's that been um, a, a one area that I've published in. And okay. then recently I've had um, um, a more interest in, in writing about the teaching of older literature. So I've had um, a couple of pieces on um, working with translations, in, mm -hmm. particularly in world lit, mm -hmm. um, and um, how to productively ask students to read a translation and know, um, I guess, how to approach it without knowing the source language. Because that's a toughie, okay. you know. Okay. We don't yeah. all know the source languages, and so Certainly. What is there to say about a translation if you can't compare it to the original? <laughs> right, right. So, that's true. Um, so I recently had a piece in the um, journal Pedagogy okay. that I was really pleased about it and included some student work. Oh, wow. Oh. So, yeah, that's so great. that was really yeah. fun. Sure. So, I've, I've got to ask you know, we have a lot of um, college students that watch this show. We have a lot of high school students that um, are looking to go to college um, and trying to kind of figure out what they want to do. And I'm curious as you're talking and you're very passionate about your field and what you do. As you look back, at what point did you decide, this is what I want to study, this is where mm. I want to spend my life? Mm. Well, I think like a lot of college professors, I sort of fell into it gradually. Uh -huh. I think okay. most of us didn't, you know, right. immediately leave high school, leave saying, leave high school and say, the PhD, <laughs> yes, That's this what is I'm it. Doing. I mean, I, I was really hoping, I was, I was nervous about college. I was really hoping just, you know, to graduate. Is that right? And, yeah. you know, okay. I did well, but it was intimidating. And mm -hmm. I went to a really selective institution, and so it was hard. And it was, you know, uh, that freshman year. Right. It, very, very difficult to imagine immediately, you know, um, shooting for higher goals, you know. So. And, and this is Notre Dame you went mm -hmm. to right now, right? Right. And we know the Irish are hard to deal with anyway. That's, <laughs> really, that's, really that's right. And I had a, um, a difficult Irish roommate. You yeah. know, <laughs> that was it. Yeah. She's my lifelong pal. But <laughs> she actually had an aunt who was a professor at Loyola. Oh, is that right? And I okay. remember distinctly that she said at one point, yeah, my, my aunt has a really cool life. I, I think it would be great to, to do what she does. And I thought, oh, as if. Oh, okay, sure. You know, <laughs> uh, that's, that's not my, I can't imagine. But um, um, I think students can also relate to this. You know, by the time they get to be juniors and seniors and they're really grooving on their 
major right, area. Right. Sometimes at that point you feel um, reluctant to let it go, right? Sure, at that, yeah, then right. you're yeah, like, you hey, committed. you know, I want to keep doing I this. I really like this. Yeah. I really am fired up, and I'm not ready to be done. Feel yet. some real commitment. This, yeah. is a, this is a good gig. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, um, so I decided. Well, um, among the other options that I had, I would go ahead and apply to graduate school. Mm -hmm. And I had had done a double major in German um, and studied abroad for a year. Oh, okay. So a lot of my peers were also doing um, kind of cool things, applying to work at embassies. And um, I interviewed to work at the CIA oh, wow. as an analyst, oh, interesting. <laughs> which I often wonder what what would that path have been like? That's you know? sure. Um, sure. But I think they would have sent me right back to grad school to learn a few more languages, and then I would have been in a basement in Alexandria, <laughs> reading, you know, yes. the missives. I don't know that I that that I would have ever made a good spy, but um, uh -huh. but a, an analyst. Um, but so then I got offered a fellowship at the University of Alabama. Okay. Um, and so I did an MA there, and. Um, by that second year, I was starting to feel the burnout. Okay. You know. Okay. Yeah. Um, it happens, right? Because right. it was year six at that point yes. of you know pretty hard charging. So um, I finished my thesis, and I had been thinking about teaching, particularly at like a prep school in Metro Atlanta or somewhere where you know I could, I don't know, I really get to know the students right. and and. Um, little smaller campus yeah. atmosphere where you can kind of do some things that you wouldn't typically be able to do in a public school. Exactly. In terms of kind of right. that whole teaching. life, you know, that I'm going to devote myself to this pursuit of knowledge and young people and blah, sure. blah, blah. And um, anyway, life intervened, and I <laughs> found myself um, married and with a young child within a year, okay. less than a okay. year after that. Uh -huh. um, and so I um, stayed at home for not quite a year um, and then started to feel like I might lose my mind. And, um, <laughs> I've got to do something. Yeah, yeah, and I needed to get out of my bathrobe. So mm -hmm. I applied to teach at um, um, a couple of local universities as an adjunct. Mm -hmm. Sure. And mm -hmm. um, ended up doing that for a year, calendar year or so, and really mm -hmm. liked it. Okay. And mm -hmm. it was the first time that I had taught at the college level without also being in grad school. Oh. So that was kind of refreshing. Yeah, you, you have a little more time. You don't have to do the homework the same exactly. way. Yeah. Exactly. And I, you know, I was sort of the, you know, the highest, the, the not the highest, the happiest uh, version, I suppose, of adjunct labor in that um, I had another income, so I wasn't, you know, Dependent. yeah, right. being completely exploited. Right. And, um, <laughs> And I only had, you know, a couple of classes, mm -hmm. so yeah. it was nice. I, I mean, I, I, this is a different subject, but you know, I feel really strongly about it, the system of um, contingent labor that yes. higher ed has really, really you know, down. embarked, embarked yes. down. And I think there's a lot of uh, a lot of uh, work that needs to be done to change the way we do things. But for certain people in certain life situations. That I myself experienced, it, it's it's the right fit. It works. Sure. It gave me some more experience, and and at that point, mm -hmm. <laughs> so this is post MA, post you know lecturing as an adjunct for a year. I I had enough encouragement from my colleagues in that department to say, I think this is a life I want. I'm going to go for the terminal degree, mm -hmm. and so then I applied mm -hmm. to PhD programs and. And and knew at that point pretty clearly, you know, what I was there to do, and the kind of institution that I was hoping to end eventually up. end up in. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. okay, that's great. That's interesting. And that yeah, got you out to Washington. I, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think it always is interesting to hear people's stories of how they mm -hmm. get to to, in this case, as a faculty member at a university, how they go there. I think so many people outside of universities think that. We just go from high school into college and decide and we want to be a professor there. someday type yeah. of thing. And yeah. it, the road is so varied. Right. And a lot of people didn't major as undergrads in, in the, the same field. field. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Right. Uh, I myself was an engineer for several years before I that's right. decided there to get into go. teaching. So. Yeah. Well, we're uh, at the point where we're going to have to take a break.
Okay. And I'd just like to remind you, you're watching Education Forum. Watch Got Therapy with psychologist Dr. Dan Rose each week on Columbus State Television, on iTunes, on Roku, or on the web at csu.tv. Watch This Week in Space Science with Dr. Sean Cruzen each week on Columbus State Television, on iTunes, on Roku, or on the web at csu.tv. Hi, we're back in Education Forum with our special guest, Dr. Susan Rock, who is the director of the Center for Teaching and Learning. And we're going to talk a little bit about the center now. Great. Because uh, we talked a little bit about her in the first portion. And, um, so what is the Center for Teaching and Learning? Well, um, I think uh, a lot of people may not be aware that university professors often receive no particular training in teaching. That's true. Um, we're experienced um, experts in our subject matter, but mm -hmm. not necessarily um, uh, expertly prepared to enter the classroom. Okay. Um, and so uh, a, a couple of decades ago, a movement started on university campuses to develop um, centers where um, university faculty could go to um, hone their teaching skills in particular, um, and it has uh, kind of um, um, grown to, to also encompass um, a support for faculty and their other roles as researchers and, um, and administrators and the mm -hmm. field of faculty development is really all about um, offering kind of the um, all of the resources and support that faculty members need in, in all of their roles. Okay, now how long have you been in the, the director? Um, this is just my second year. I okay. started in the fall of 2012. All right. Yeah. Now, is most of your effort into training professors how to teach? Well, you know, it's funny. I, I have kind of an um, instinctive, uh, I don't know, a, a response to the word train that's okay. not such a happy one. Oh, it reminds okay. me of being okay. a pet, and I, <laughs> I don't really love that okay. idea but um, but I, I mean I think um, my hope for the center is that we offer plenty of resources you know online and um, in print form in a library and um, through on-campus workshops that people can find what they need Mm -hmm. and can kind of seek us out to um, meet whatever sorts of challenges that they've already identified that they're facing. Okay. Um, so um, I'm hoping to be kind of responsive to what people um, are looking for. Okay. Rather than seeing myself as some sort of, um, you know, guru who's determining <laughs> what everyone should be this doing. is what you need yeah so exactly. how, how do you get your message out to faculty that you're available and yeah well this is there? tricky isn't okay. it yeah the faculty are um, squirrely mm. that way <laughs> but um, we just did a little survey in fact and everyone said email 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 okay. this is how we prefer to be contacted and I'm sensitive to our overload of email sure. yes so um, I have stopped kind of sending everybody a message about every opportunity um, and tried to condense it into one weekly All right. bulletin mm -hmm. and I, I have, mm -hmm. yeah, yes, I have a really um, amazing administrative coordinator Christine Kunta who is putting together the bulletin okay. and so I sort of feed her you know events and activities and information and she um, pulls that all together and sends it out Monday morning at 8 a.m. 
Okay. She does do a good job, I can tell you. Yeah. Uh, you know, we talk quite often about uh, certain people, and you, you know this, and you just mentioned it, certain people that send out information on email that's important mm -hmm. information, but it comes often throughout the week, and mm -hmm. you get to the point where we talk about it becoming <laughs> spam. And yes. so you see an email from someone, and you just click right over it because it becomes yeah. in your mind yeah. uh, spam. And we have yeah. that happening quite a bit with yes. different people in our college. Uh, but uh, Christine, when it comes from her, it doesn't mm -hmm. come often enough. No, it doesn't. And it's condensed. It's yeah. concise. It's clear. And so you can click on it and get right out of it. And well, you do I, take the time to read them that, too. That's right. I really appreciate your, your sharing that because it's new. I mean, we just started it this semester. Yes. Right, right. And we're being a little sneaky with it in that <laughs> um, we're trying to put links in the bulletin to other social media okay. that we're working on okay. as well. So we've got a Facebook page. Mm. We've got a web blog. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, we try to get the word out in a number of different ways. So, so. I was not aware of the role of the Center for yeah. Teaching and Learning. Mm -hmm. And I'm amazed. I think it's a great resource out there. Are most mm -hmm. faculty like me? You know, um, I wish I knew. Okay. Um, okay. I, I, I'm still learning a lot about this whole field myself. Mm -hmm. um, it was not something that I, I, I've learned from having gone to a couple of national conferences in faculty development now, that most people find themselves in teaching and learning centers the way I did, which is you are a senior faculty member, mm -hmm. you have excelled in the classroom, someone says, hey, how about if you do the <laughs> Center for Teaching and Learning? And okay. the person says, well, I don't really know anything about that. And they say, yes, you do. Feel you're doing free. it. Yeah, yeah you're doing it now. Okay, okay. So, um, uh, at any rate, I, I think I would like to um, try to do a survey, I, I've been thinking about this soon, that not only helps me become aware of our um, profile on campus, but mm -hmm. also finds out a lot more about the state of teaching at Columbus State. Okay. I mean, I, I wish I had a better handle on what sorts of things everyone does, you mm -hmm. know? Yeah. Um, I have an anecdotal sense of what right. people do in their classroom, right. but right. I'd really like to find out more about how many people are using, you know, kind of more active learning techniques mm -hmm. and yeah. mm -hmm. what exactly is going on. I, th I think that's an, that's interesting because especially right now where we're seeing a lot of change happening at campuses across mm -hmm. the country and each campus is trying to figure out, each faculty member is trying to figure out what this change means for them and mm -hmm. how they fit in and, and how it fits in with their role and, yeah. and, and what their role even is as yeah. these changes are occurring. Yeah. And yeah. so we are in a state of flux on campuses. Absolutely. Yeah, we are. I think yeah. figuring out what's taking the pulse of what's going on in classrooms. It's, it's not the classroom that most people imagine or remember from or what it you used know, to 20 be. years yeah. ago. That's right. 30 years ago. That's right. Uh, but what really is happening, and I like the term that you use there, how many, the active learning strategies. You know, yeah. How mm -hmm. are professors really yeah. looking at uh, yeah. engaging students in a much more active way? Exactly. Mm -hmm. So do you do any outreach at all? Or is this just we're just here and here's our resources and here's our email or um, um, is there a need for outreach? I mean, outreach, I, I guess. What, as, I mean, like, are there professors out there that could really benefit from your service? That. Um, well, I, I, every year we have um, a faculty center fellowship, okay. and that particular. Um, opportunity that comes with a stipend is um, a way of kind of broadening our reach because the fellows are specifically tasked or, or they win their fellowship by coming up with a project mm -hmm. that they think will um, involve more faculty in some particular area of development. So. Right. Right. Um, for example, just today, there's a forum going on in the library that uh, John Finley is right. leading. He's okay. a faculty center fellow okay. this year. And we're keeping you away from that. Well, <laughs> and I'm going to need to jump up and run away in just a moment. But um, at any rate, I mean, I, I appreciate the work that the fellows do so much just because they allow the center to have sort of a wider reach. And when they okay. come from... Um, different colleges across campus, then they're in contact with a bunch of other people that I may not necessarily see. And um, I hope that's an effective okay. outreach. Yeah, it sounds like yeah. it to me. Yeah, yeah, I just want to hear about those projects. <laughs> um, yeah. So, what do you see for the future of the center? 
Where do you see it going? Well, um, we have, um, I think, lots of exciting things on the on the horizon. Um, one major initiative that the whole university is going to be involved with in the next couple of years and the faculty center will be kind of taking the lead on is developing a new QEP topic. Okay. Which okay. is quality enhancement plan. It's something that um, uh, SACS requires yes. of colleges and universities. Um, and the faculty, our faculty center at, at CSU was in fact um, initiated in I think 2005 or six, um, mm -hmm, to meet mm -hmm. the uh, very first QEP um, plan. All right. And All so right. Jim Owen was mm -hmm. the um, director at that point, and he launched the pro the QEP program on writing, enhancing yes. writing yes. across the university. So um, my task over the next couple of well. 18 months or so, we're mm -hmm. about to start um, at the end of the semester and in the fall, is to start gathering consensus about a new topic and a I new see. initiative. Okay. Okay. And um, so that's a big thing on oh, the yeah, horizon. Oh, yeah, that's huge. Yeah. And um, I may not then, you know, be the person who we um, um, identify as the specialist in that particular area who really will be the point person for the QEP at that point. Okay. But the Faculty Center will always be, you know, an important kind of structural support for whatever that project is. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Well, I'm going to shift gears just a little bit again. Yeah. And I want to talk about your show. Oh, right. Yeah. That's an exciting You thing have a on show here on uh, CSU TV. Yeah. And it's called the inside the professor study. Right. Okay. Right. Um, so it has yet to see air. Oh, but, um, now you've done five episodes. Yeah, we, we're putting, we're, see I'm learning all the lingo, they're in the can. They're in the can, right. okay, okay. Um, <laughs> and so we're, you know, kind of, uh, I guess, uh, stockpiling our interviews so that we can launch the first season. Mm -hmm. And um, the idea is sort of a funny one modeled on, um, a and E's inside the actor's studio. Okay. So I get to be James Lipton. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yes. And, you do a great impression. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, I'm waiting for the moment where I can say, you are a brilliant, blinding light. That's, cool. <laughs> yeah. that's it. But, that's it. Um, yeah. Or something more outrageous. But um, at any rate, uh, the idea is to um, find out more about the many fascinating people who teach here okay. and specifically to ask them um, some kind of behind the scenes information. Mm -hmm. um, how it's similar, I guess, to some of the things that you asked me this morning. How mm -hmm. did I get into this field and okay. uh, things about my teaching and um, just to give people a better sense of faculty members as human beings mm -hmm. and as, you know, people who are very thoughtful about um, what they bring to students and okay so what motivated you to create this show um well i think partly i was motivated by um the passing of our former dean bill chapel okay. in the college sure. of arts and letters mm -hmm. then um i had a feeling that there's i think our generation of faculty that came to csu in the 70s is this sort of wealth of um, of history and resources that uh, we don't want to lose sure. through stories. Mm -hmm. And so I initially pitched the idea for a show that would focus on um, the retired faculty who are still in the community okay. um, as a fellowship project, actually, for the Faculty Center. Okay. And then there were so many other good fellowship projects that year that mine was not one that was chosen. Okay. So I, you know, shoved it in my file drawer. And then um, Mike Baltimore came to see me a few months ago and said, um, hey, we're, we're interested in some new programs for the CSU TV, and what do you think the Faculty Center might be able to do? And oh, so okay. I said, as a matter of fact, let me look at my file drawer. <laughs> I might have, I have something, something here. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and so off we go. We're doing it. Okay. Okay, now how well has it been received with those uh, five people that you've asked to be Well, on? you know, I'm so grateful that they uh, are game to do this and they seem to um, enjoy just having the chance to have a nice long conversation about teaching and okay. 
what it means to be a um, live the life of the mind mm -hmm. that I think so far um, it's been really fun for okay. everyone to be on the show but then of course they haven't seen the program yet. it hasn't so. aired right. yes yeah um, it could come to a you know screeching halt <laughs> <laughs> how long is it mm. um, well uh, we had imagined that it would be short, that we'd cut okay. a lot, but my uh, producer seems to feel that it might be worth letting run because people have interesting things to say. So it may be as long as an hour okay. if people okay. can stay attentive for that long. Always an issue. We've, we've found that same thing, that, that <laughs> hour. Yeah. Is, yeah. What I love about your idea, uh, going back to how it, where it's rooted in, in your thinking, um, I love the fact that students can have an opportunity to connect with professors mm -hmm. uh, in a way that they typically don't. It mm -hmm. gives them, as you said, some of the inside story mm -hmm. and the humanness of professors. And I think that's really important in terms of engaging mm -hmm. students, uh, whether it's engaging them in British literature or engaging them in engineering or you know, whatever it might business, to see that professor as somebody that's gone through some stuff in life, very similar maybe. Mm -hmm. to what they're thinking yeah. of doing, you know, that's yeah. very cool. I like to ask them what they themselves were like as college students. Yes, that's right, Which that's right. they, you know, that's not always something they expected to be <laughs> asked, so. Right, right. Gary right. Strayberry said, I don't know if I want to answer that question. Oh, that's wow. Right. That's right. That's right. So, so is that <laughs> no, where you made him cry? Really. Is no, that where you I pinned him down? No, I have no. not yet made anyone cry. Oh, okay, okay. I've, you know, it's still working on it. It's still, yeah, yeah, it's still, still a young yeah, program. You're hoping. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, where did you come up with the interesting opener? I just think oh, it's great. Oh, well, you know, um, again, credit to the, uh, the studio here. Dr. Baltimore and his genius. Oh, I mean, it's mm -hmm. great. It just, it. It Isn't it cool? The music's yeah. cool. The music, too? Did you, yeah. did you do the music? No, or, but no, I did so it love it. It's noir and jazz. Yes, and, it is. Right. Yeah. Yes, it is. It's awesome. So is there a time slot picked out yet? Well, I, I had suggested Sunday evenings okay. just because um, I think it's a moment when people are sort of ready for something maybe a little slower and more reflective, reflective mm -hmm. and sure. so I'm hoping it's that'll work. Transition evening okay. in terms of people's uh, week and yeah. that sort yeah. of thing. Yeah. Cool. So and, and, and you go up against 60 Minutes, which is... Right. You know, yeah, and, and I'd rather watch right. your show than 60 <laughs> When do you think it's going to roll out? Um, well, I hope sometime in the next semester. Okay, okay. Yeah. Is he uh, requiring you to have a full season done before it comes out? I don't know. Oh, we, okay. we, yeah, we're right. sort of, you know, flying by the seat of our pants okay. here. Jeff, we'll yeah. and, and Jeff was telling me Harley Davidson is a sponsor. <laughs> sponsor. Is that <laughs> That's in the works. Yeah, right? It's my dream. Um, <laughs> well, I don't know. I, I, maybe you guys wanted to get them. Well, we did. Oh, you did? Yeah, so right. far, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's right. we're, wow. we're working on it. Wow. Well, I'd just like to thank you for coming on the show today and Thanks talking about, me. you know, all of your projects, you know, with, with the Center for Teaching and Learning and, and your career and your new thank show. You. And we look forward to, to seeing it when it's out. And, well, uh, thanks. I, and, you uh, know, I feel very lucky to have inherited such a strong um, program from Dr. Iris Saltiel, my predecessor. Okay. And I, you know, I think it's always easier to build on something that somebody else has already, you know, put a really solid foundation on. And sure. so I'm lucky in that, you know, Jim Owen and Iris mm -hmm. Saltiel had really done some hard work with the Faculty Center um, in the years, um, you know, before I, sure. before I came on board. So I'm just trying to keep the flame lit. Excellent. Keep the lights Excellent. on. Well, we'd like to, you know, think about having you back another time if you'd, you'd like to do well, that. Well, thank you. We'll wait till your show gets rolling a little bit and okay. we can go ahead and talk about that. Great. Great. Well, thank you very much. And I'd like to thank you for watching Education Forum. And I'm Jeff Conklin.